So <laughs> it's, a, it's a great pleasure to be um, able to speak on this uh, as part of the AIDA um, Academy, as it's uh, called, and uh, to support this activity. It seems like a very exciting uh, venture, and we're very pleased to be involved uh, in uh, a couple of the networks that uh, are involved, the ELISE and the Humane AI Net. Um, so the, as it's uh, set up as a doctoral academy, what I've put together, is, and this has been with co-authors Benjamin uh, Gedge, Maria Perez-Ortiz, and Omar Venus Plata, I've, I've put together what is more like a tutorial uh, on uh, a little introduction to statistical learning theory and in particular, a bit of a dive into Pac Bayesian analysis. Uh, the idea is to sort of give you a background, but hopefully, you know, towards the end, give you some insight into current developments and in particular applications to deep learning uh, in order to make this sort of, you know, relevant to current research activity. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to kick in um, and start with a kind of motivational couple of uh, slides just to try to understand what we're trying to do with statistical learning theory. So uh, learning is, is about generalizing. Um, and if we think about that in terms of, uh, you know, learning from data, we're trying to see the pattern that emerges from a, a set of training data. And there, the illustration here shows that we can either be uh, uh, you know, misled in terms of the underlying phenomenon. Uh, in other words, the green line is perhaps being a bit too over ambitious in trying to make all of the training data correctly classified and ending up with something that doesn't look very sensible. Uh, on the other hand, and that would correspond to so-called overfitting. Um, and uh, the black line is perhaps something that looks more sensible and perhaps would be likely to generalize well. So generalize means perform well on data we haven't yet seen. And that's the important question. How do we understand how to analyze the performance on unseen data? So statistical learning theory is a, about trying to do that, uh, but it's trying to do that in a way that uh, takes into account that the particular training data we're viewing is generated randomly. And so it's a, we're thinking of a, a, a distribution that's generating our data, and we see a sample of that distribution drawn typically uh, independently, IID. Um, and what we're hoping is that what we learn from that IID data will perform well on uh, new data generated by the same distribution. So the link between the training data and the test data is this uh, underlying distribution that's generating the data. And when we think about that, the, the first question is, well, if the data generated in that training data is random, how, how can we be sure that we're not misled? There may be some you know, uh, chance that in that data, there is some pattern that is not real, it's just there by chance. And so we want to be uh, viewing this a bit like a statistical test. When you think of a statistical test, you have some data and you want to speak about your conclusion holding with high confidence. And this is what statistical learning theory attempts to do. So we think of a, for a fixed algorithm, function class, sample size, as we generate random sets of training data, we get a distribution of true test errors. And that distribution is you know, something we want to control. Uh, but we want to control it in a way that uh, when we work with our single training set, we actually are confident we're going to be doing a good job. Um, and one way that I think uh, one's tempted to do and which statistical learning theory does not do is look at the mean of that error distribution. Um, and I'll give an example in a minute to show the difference between looking at the mean and thinking about a high confidence uh, analysis. Um, a mean can be misleading. And when I say a uh, learner has only one sample, I mean only one training set. Uh, think of a training set as a sample. Um, statistical learning theory is interested in looking at the tail of that distribution and finding bounds which hold with high probability over that generation 
of training sets of, and we think of size of that set as being fixed of size n. Okay, so it's a finite fixed n we're thinking about. Uh, and as I said, we can compare that to a statistical test. You know, we want to have, let's say, a 99% confidence that the conclusion we draw, the thing we learn from that sample, is is uh, is valid. And this leads to the an acronym, probably approximately correct, which means you, we are probably, in other words, the chances that we were misled by the training data is small, um, approximately correct. In other words, the error that we will experience on new data will be, will be low. In other words, the probability that we have large error, I don't know if you can see here, uh, over this M sample, the probability that our learnt hypothesis will have large error will be small, less than some delta, whereas delta is this probability of being misled. Um, so I'm just going to show you now, uh, and so with high confidence, it's probably approximately correct. The, the probability that we're approximately correct is greater than or equal to 1 minus delta. So here are two uh, distributions of test errors generated by from a real data set, in fact, the breast cancer data set from the UCI repository. And uh, we've just applied two different algorithms. The blue algorithm is a, a Parson window approximator and the blue, red algorithm is a sport vector machine. And what you can notice immediately is that they look actually pretty similar. I, I should say the sport vector machine is using a linear kernel, so they're entirely able to access the same set of functions. But the support vector machine is being much more cautious in uh, controlling the error. And if you look at the uh, high errors that occur, they're far more frequent with the PARS and window estimator. Uh, so the means are actually very, uh, very, only very slightly different. So if we were targeting the means, we might say there's not much to choose between these two algorithms. But in terms of the uh, 95th percentile that I've marked there, there's clearly a big difference. There's much less chance of being misled by the training data for the support vector machine than there is for the uh, PARS and window estimator. Uh, so that's exactly what statistical learning theory is attempting to do. It's trying to optimize, bring down this 95th percentile as much as possible and design algorithms that will actually make that happen. So uh, just a bit of mathematical formulation. I'll take this fairly quickly because uh, I think a lot of you may be familiar with it, but the, uh, and if not, probably it's too much to take in anyway. So uh, just so that we're on the same page, we're thinking of a learning algorithm mapping a, an M sample to a hypothesis a class, selecting effectively a predictor. Uh, in our case, we probably mainly think of classifiers with the training set is a set of uh, labeled examples, uh, as I said, typically randomly drawn IID from the un, uh, underlying data generating distribution, which we're denoting here by uh, a P. Um, the main point is here, the learner does not know P and the only thing that he learns uh, about P, uh, he must learn from this uh, random uh, training sample. Um, of course, you know, this is a very idealized set uh, of assumptions. Some of these assumptions can be relaxed, but we're not going to talk about that within this uh, lecture. So what we would like to do from that sample is do actually two things. The typical thing we're thinking about doing is learning a predictor. But what we want to do in addition is certify that predictor's performance on future unseen data. So learning the predictor, we are thinking of an algorithm driven by some learning principle, informed by prior knowledge, resulting in inductive bias. And certifying is looking at what happens on the training data and using generalization bounds to then infer what will happen on test data. And the interesting thing about this study is, you know, it does sound uh, at first sight quite a, you know, um, navel gazing theoretical for its own sake uh, uh, enterprise, but these two goals actually interact. So by having certification of performance, that can then drive 
a learning principle which actually determines how the algorithm operates and what it attempts to optimize. So clearly it's not you know, the case that this is just delivering uh, a certification, it's also potentially informing the actual algorithm that is selecting the predictor uh, in order to select the predictor that has the best uh, certif certificate. So uh, how do we measure uh, performance? Typically we have a loss function which measures a discrepancy between the output of our predictor and the true label um, or true output. It may not be a label, it could be a real valued output. Um, and then we have an empirical estimate of that, which is just the average on the training data, so-called in sample, uh, hence in here, and theoretical risk, which is the expected value of uh, this uh, loss function when evaluated on a randomly generated test sample. So this is this expected sample, uh, expected loss on a test point, and this is the uh, measure we have on the training data. And here's just a few examples of the kind of loss functions that are considered. Zero, one loss is just simply, is the label correct or not? A squared loss for regression, a hinge loss, which is used in uh, uh, support vector training and log loss, which you can use for density estimation and so on. So uh, generalization, as we've already said, is, the question is, uh, given how well we do on in-sample pairs, how well will we do on out-of-sample pairs? And there's a typically a generalization gap. Um, if we pick a hypothesis at random, we would expect these two to be aligned because there's no reason why the sample that we generated from uh, in our training data should be different in performance from an, uh, a new sample point. So we would expect these two to be aligned. But when we do training, we typically optimize to give our in sample performance improve. So we're optimizing our H, we're choosing our H to do well on this data and this may cause us to have bias, which means that we won't do so well as we think we are doing uh, on the out of sample data. So this gap is critical in understanding, uh, you know, the difference between how well we're doing on our training data and how well we're actually going to do on our test data. So we're calling this Delta H and typically we're looking for upper bounds that hold with high probability. Uh, that tell us that delta H will be less than some function of uh, M, M and delta, where delta is the confidence. Uh, when we say with high probability, we mean with probability at least one minus delta. Um, and this tells us that our test set performance is less than or equal to the sample performance, the empirical performance, uh, plus this epsilon. Lower bounds can also be considered uh, but I won't be talking about those. Um, flavors, distribution free, which is this making no assumptions about the distribution, which is what I've been talking about up until now. When I say distribution, the distribution generating the data. We can also consider more theoretical studies of making assumptions about the distribution, but it's very uh, typically very difficult to make realistic assumptions about distributions in the real world because they capture complex phenomena. So the distribution free model is far more realistic if we want to have uh, uh, results that will apply for, for real data. Um, we can also consider algorithm free, so something that holds based on properties of the particular um, uh, hypothesis, for example, its margin on the training data, for example, or it's empirical, obviously it will involve its empirical performance, but the, the gap will maybe involve other properties of this function H. Um, or it, they could be algorithm dependent, so they are actually only holding for the output function of a particular algorithm. Again, we're mostly beginning to be considering distribution free and algorithm free. Um, so I'm just going to give a very quick kind of historical uh, a flash slide of uh, things that have led up to or, or come before the pack Bayes analysis that I'll principally be talking about. So there's a very kind of simple building block you can use with a single hypothesis. 
which simply is, you know, uh, uh, given a sample of size m, what is the chance that your true error is very different from your uh, empirical error, and you just look at the chances of being misled by uh, that sample, and it's very simple to calculate uh, an estimate of this type. Um, and then you can just leverage this for a finite function class by simply doing um, a union bound over the probability of being misled by uh, not just one function, but uh, uh, one of uh, uh, the number of functions in this class, which I'm denoting by this uh, absolute value of h. Uh, so that's just a count of the number of functions. And so you just divide delta by that number and the probability that one of them is misleads you is bounded by uh, this, uh, this function here. Um, you can also introduce weights, uh, data dependent hypothesis weights with a prior weight PI and uh, associate this provided that the sum of the prior weights uh, is, is less than or equal to one, then this will hold with uh, probability one minus delta. Uh, and you get a different value effectively for uh, each HI that you might choose and it allows you to do so-called structural risk minimization. Uncountably infinite function classes, um, or indeed countably infinite, uh, sorry, yeah, uncountably infinite function classes, you need to move to more sophisticated strategies. And the classic bound is, involves the, that picture of an Incus dimension or VC dimension. Uh, we can also use bounds depending on the Radamacher complexity, which is a, again a measure of complexity of a function class. Um, these approaches are suited to analyze the performance of individual functions and to some extent take into account correlations between functions. Uh, but uh, Pack Bayes allows us to consider distributions over hypotheses. And this is really the innovation that I think gives it its uh, extra uh, flexibility and power. So I'm going to now talk about the Pack Bayes analysis. Um, and uh, the framework is. Uh, Sounds uh, a little bit familiar if you're familiar with Bayesian inference, uh, but is uh, uh, subtly different or, or even not so subtly different, but I'll, I'll describe the difference uh, in a little bit more detail once I've introduced it. So the, before you see the data, you must fix a distribution over the hypothesis space. And we call this the prior distribution in analogy with Bayesian inference. Um, Based on the data, you can choose a posterior distribution, learn a posterior distribution Q uh, over the hypotheses. We call this the posterior. Um, and when we make a prediction, we actually draw, uh, we don't have a fixed function typically. We have a, a random function drawn according to that posterior distribution. And then we predict with the chosen, uh, chosen function. So every time we get a test point, we draw a function according to Q. Uh, and then we predict according to Q. So if we predict, uh, make a prediction with the same point twice, we might get a different uh, output. Uh, so every prediction we have a fresh random draw. So the risk measures are extensions of our previous ones, the you know, empirical and uh, uh, out of sample test, R in and R out but they're now averaged according to this posterior distribution, uh, as you might expect. So now there's an average risk based on the distribution that generates uh, the posterior distribution of uh, over the hypothesis H. Um, furthermore, we use this uh, standard pullback Leibler uh, notation for the pullback Leibler divergence between these two distributions. So in order for this to be finite, the Q must be absolutely continuous with respect to P. Um, so here's the uh, slide to just sort of make the connections with Bayesian inference and, and also the, the, the distinctions. Um, so in Bayesian inference, typically the prior is in some way uh, intended to capture the true um, uh, likelihood of different, well, likelihood again, the wording here is very difficult in, in Bayesian inference because it becomes a bit philosophical, but there is some kind of known environment in which 
we have a, a, an expectation that certain functions may occur more probably than others, and this defines our prior. And Bayesian inference relies on that prior being correct in some sense. And then uh, there's a, a likelihood function that allows us to update that prior and create the posterior distribution. So given the prior and given the training data, there is a direct mapping to the posterior distribution. It may be hard to compute, may not have a closed form, et cetera, but there is a, a you know, correct posterior distribution. So in this pac Bayes model, um, there's not a, re a requirement that the prior be correct in any sense. Uh, you can choose any distribution you want uh, and the bound that you get out will be true. Um, the difference will be if you make a good choice, the bound may be more useful or give better bounds or more useful bounds than if you make a poor choice of prior. But the wrong choice of prior, I mean wrong in the sense of bad choice, does not invalidate the, uh, the theorem. Okay, so the theorems are true, whatever the prior is, it's just how useful they might be. And furthermore, uh, there's no requirement when choosing the posterior distribution that it be determined by some fixed mapping. You can choose your posterior distribution in any way you want. And again, the theorem will be true. Um, so, of course, algorithms will attempt to choose the posterior distribution to optimize the bound, but that's valid, and that is indeed what uh, the pac Bayes theory tells you you can do. So you may, there may be a unique or, or small set of distributions that optimize the bound given a particular prior and a particular training set, and you may want to choose those, but you don't have to. Uh, you can choose maybe uh, some that are simpler to compute. Uh, uh, and that uh, give nonetheless good bounds. And we'll certainly be demonstrating that. Um, so uh, think of the prior as an exploration mechanism for H and posterior as the twisted prior after confronting with the data. Um, so uh, this is one more slide just about um, the prior and posterior and the difference between pack bays and, and bays. So bounds hold for any distribution in the pack bays. Uh, in Bayesian inference, prior choice impacts inference. Posterior holds for any posterior distribution. Uh, the posterior is uniquely defined by the prior statistical model. Um, the data distribution is also something that is plays a different role. In pack bays, the, the distribution is, is absolutely key. This is now the distribution not over the, uh, the functions, which is the prior and posterior distributions are over the functions, but the distribution that's generating the data. So this is crucially uh, uh, important in the pack base. It holds for any distribution, um, but it, it plays a key role. Whereas in Bayesian inference, the randomness lies in the noise model generating the output. So it doesn't rely on the uh, generation process for the inputs. Uh, in that sense. Okay, so here's uh, the um, general theorem, uh, pac Bayes theorem. Uh, it relies on a convex function which maps uh, the interval 0, 1 um, cross 0, 1 to the reals, which needs to be, yes, I said convex. Um, uh, we'll talk about a particular choice, but let's just leave it open at the moment and use this uh, delta symbol to de define that. We're thinking of it as a distance between the, uh, the in-sample performance, in-sample rate of error, and the out-sample rate of error. So this is the kind of comparison of the, you know, if you like, the gap, the measurement of the gap between the, uh, uh, you know, training performance and uh, test performance. So think of that as your delta as you're measuring that gap. Um, and the theorem states that for any distribution, so any gen data generating distribution, and any prior distribution over the set of uh, uh, functions, uh, and any delta function, we have with probability at least one minus delta, that this difference, this gap between training and test performance is going to be less than or equal to and notice this is the stochastic version of that, according to this distribution, Q, posterior distribution. And this holds for any posterior distribution. 
is less than or equal to one on M sample size, KL divergence between the um, uh, posterior and prior uh, logarithm of this quantity I, I delta of M, which is uh, this quantity here, which typically is bounded to be some small function of M, like uh, say two root M or something like that in, in, in some cases we'll look at, but this is a general form. Um, divided by delta, where delta is your confidence this is holding with a probability of a nice delta. Okay, so you can see here immediately, if we're thinking about this as driving an algorithm, your Q it has two conflicting tensions here. On the one hand, you want to make this small um, because you, in other words, you don't want to move too far from your prior because you're gonna pay a cost in this KL term here. On the other hand, your prior may not be very good at making this uh, uh, empirical error small. So you want to move Q away from the prior to reduce this quantity here, make it small, and hence uh, uh, ensure that there's a good bound on the out of sample performance. This is the thing we're hoping to, to uh, place a bound on through this theorem. So there's a, a conflict, a, you know, a conflict here between the two constraints. One is we want this to be small. The other is we also want this to be small. And so uh, we're going to be, you know, trading those two in, in when we apply this theorem. But we are actually free to do that in any way we want because this theorem holds true for every posterior distribution. So we can actually optimize Q to minimize or the effective bound on this out of sample performance, if we can do that. Okay, um, I'm gonna just sketch very briefly the, um, the key ingredients of this theorem. I'm, I'm not expecting, I mean, you know, if I saw this for the first time, I certainly would not follow this. So I'm not expecting you necessarily to follow it, but um, I'm, I'm, wanting to do it just to convince you this isn't actually very deep mathematics. This is actually surprisingly simple um, derivation. Um, but, you know, nonetheless, it provides, you know, some very tight bounds. So the key uh, ingredient is probably this, this step here, which is a, a change of measure inequality. Um, so why do we start with this? Well, that's just, you know, the, the trick, if you start with this quantity, where phi is some function of the, uh, we'll see what it is in the concrete application, but this is just a general step. I'm gonna replace phi with something else in a minute. Um, if we take a minus log of an expectation over the prior of e to the phi of h, where phi is some function of the uh, hypothesis, um, we can change measure to expectation of, over q by then uh, putting in a weighting P of H over Q of H, which effectively moves us back to having an expectation over P. So these two are equal. And then we use uh, the um, Jensen inequality to move this expectation through the log. Um, and the minus sign uh, inverts the uh, uh, this is why it's changed from minus to plus here because we've uh, inverted this from Q of H, uh, P of H over Q of H, Q of H over P of H, and the minus, because it's now log of E, they cancel, so it's expectation over phi of H. And this, of course, is just the KL divergence between Q and P, okay? And there's a further standard inequality, which is Markov's inequality, which we'll make use of, which is for a random variable, uh, the probability that X is greater than or equal to A, uh, that has, uh, positive values only the, is less than or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. And so the probability that x is less than or equal to e of x over delta is greater than or equal to one minus delta, which is what we will be using. Okay, um, a little bit more preparation. This is just a simple binomial uh, uh, estimation of the probability of uh, uh, having uh, K misclassifications among M trials. So the probability that our empirical error is K over M. In other words, we make K mistakes, thinking of classification now, um, with a probability of misclassification uh, being, uh, of course, R out of H. That's the true error. 
uh, is m choose k and then r out of h the k one minus r out of h to m minus k and we're going to call that the bin k m r out of h. Uh, so now the, here's the proof uh, of the main results. We start with this. Now uh, this is m times delta e uh, the uh, empirical. This is r in q you know or e in, uh, average over the posterior distribution of the uh, in sample error out sample error. By Jensen's inequality, we can take the expectation out um, because it's a convex uh, delta is a convex function. This, by our previous uh, um, change of measure inequality, uh, is less than or equal to the KL divergence between Q and P, and this log of the expectation over the prior of E to the M. Now, this is our function phi E M delta R in of H R out of H that we used. Um, by Markov inequality, we actually uh, up, uh, upper bound this by logarithm with high probability, one minus delta, uh, this expectation over the samples generated, uh, the second sample generated uh, times one over delta. Um, and now we swap these expectations. And this is now starting to look very like that I delta M function. Um, uh, we just have to further do the binomial law here to count the probability that we have that particular K over M when we consider each of the possible uh, errors that we can experience in our in sample and uh, take an expectation uh, sum over those. And finally, if we think of this as a expectation over H, what's the worst we can do? Well, we just have to take the soup over the, the only way H enters into this is by this uh, empirical, uh, sorry, true error. So we just take the soup over the possible true errors that might occur. And that is indeed our I delta N function. So that's the proof, there it is, okay. Um, and there it is at the top of the page. Uh, and now speci specializations can be made by just choosing different values of this delta function and the simplest, uh, the, the sort of one to do for classification is this so-called mi uh, uh, mini KL, which is just the KL between the uh, two dis you know, discrete distributions of, uh, you know, probability of on zero one of probability of making an error Q, not making an error one minus Q or uh, true error, making an error P uh, uh, not making an error one minus p. So if we use that, we get this bound, and this is where we've actually used the. Uh, I'll show this in a minute, but we've got that i delta m upper bounded by two root m. Um, this is a further one for uh, you, a different form where we've simply uh, upper bounded this by two times q minus p squared. Uh, this is a Cotoni bound where we've used this value of delta c. Um, which is again just a, a different function. And uh, here's a, a further bound with a, a different value of delta LQ. So these are you know, different families of bounds that are related to this single uh, derivation that I showed. Um, and here's just this bound uh, on I delta M that I used, I mentioned here, this quantity here. Uh, I won't go through it, but it's very easy to prove that this is actually bounded by two root M in that case. Um, so notice that these uh, bounds hold true only if the samples are drawn IID, but actually this theorem is true even if the, this theorem is stated here, is true even if the samples are not generated IID. It's only in bounding this I delta of M we needed the IID assumption. So there's some flexibility there. Um, Okay, uh, now I'm going to talk about applications, uh, and I want to show you, you know, some results that indicate how even relatively straightforward applications of this idea can deliver very tight bounds and motivate, uh, you know, kind of well-known algorithms. So here we choose the prior and posterior distributions for linear classifiers to be Gaussians with unit variance. The prior will be at the origin and the uh, posterior will be centered at the weight vector that we're going to be using for the classification. Um, 
and uh, we're going to be thinking of it uh, as scaling. Sorry, that should be a mu there. That's a mistyping. Sorry about that. Mu times w as a scaling of the unit vector w. Um, so here's the prior at the origin, and here's the weight vector, and we're thinking of some scaling and the posterior in that position. So this is the pack base bound in this case. Um, here's our posterior, uh, sorry, our, our yeah, um, expected true error um, of the stochastic classifier. But actually, because uh, the uh, deterministic classifier that exactly corresponds to the sign of the expectation over the posterior distribution of C of X, um, because the center of the Gaussian gives the same classification as half, uh, as half space with more weight. So its error can therefore be bounded by twice this stochastic error. So we actually, in this case, because it's a linear classifier and we have a symmetrical posterior distribution, we can actually get a bound on a deterministic classifier, even though the theory is related to stochastic classifiers. Um, so in fact, that's uh, quite useful. Um, this is the empirical error, uh, stochastic error on the training data, and we can, without too much trouble, show that it's related to this uh, uh, expression here, where the uh, gamma here is the uh, normalized margin of the uh, data. Phi here is the, um, I'm thinking of this as a, support, uh, as a kernel learning machine, and phi of x is the embedding into the feature space of the kernel. Um, so this is the uh, margin scaled, uh, the margin scaled by the uh, norm of the embedding of the, of the point and the norm of the weight vector, which would probably be chosen to be one. And uh, phi tilde is the, um, uh, the cumulative normal distribution. Uh, so that's, we can calculate quite easily. Um, the KL between prior and posterior is very simple because it's just a two Gaussians and it turns out to be mu squared over two. And the delta is the confidence, uh, holds with one minus delta. Um, so this is then the final form of this, uh, this bound, which is uh, basically the probability of misclassification is less than or equal to twice. That was from 